All right, let's talk about a misconception about sparring in HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts, one that I've seen often enough to warrant discussion, which is basically the idea that it wouldn't be effective because people had armor, which is a notion that has always confused me. And I'm assuming it comes mainly from practitioners of other historical or historically inspired fighting, you know, Battle of the Nations type events, things like that. And uh, I'm trying really hard to not go on a rant here, admittedly biased. I've never done it myself. So of course, I'm going to be somewhat ignorant about the specifics. Just based on what I've seen so far, what bothers me about it is that it essentially feeds the stereotype of knights being clumsy and strong, but using brute force and having no real skill, not using technique, just bashing each other repeatedly with blunt instruments. Um, that's, if you look at the, the sources we have available, it couldn't be further from the truth. But, so here's a problem. First off, I mean, there's a number of problems, but first off, what even is HEMA? Uh, a lot of things, actually. This is HEMA. This is HEMA. That, and that as well. And this, you have not only a number of different weapons covered by historical European martial arts, you have a lot of different time periods. So keep that diversity in mind. Also keep in mind that not every HEMA practitioner is representative of HEMA overall. There's not only disagreement about how one should interpret the sources, how one should train, what's valid and what isn't, there's also different skill levels, of course. Not everybody does the same amount of sparring or the same quality of training, etc., etc. So having acknowledged all that, so what exactly is the issue here? I just recently had a discussion with someone who is apparently very much against HEMA because he thinks it wouldn't work because of armor. But the strange thing is I pointed out specifically that a lot of the manuscripts that we have deal with unarmored dueling. There is no armor present, uh, even though the HEMA sparring can sometimes look armored because we're wearing protective gear, you know, fencing jackets that look kind of like gambesons and basically emulate gambesons in a lot of ways, uh, and gauntlets of varying types, etc. So it might look like armor, but we're going by unarmored manuscripts. That's not the only thing, however. If you look at, for example, Fiore de Liberi, who was, as far as we can tell, likely a knight and a fencing master, which, by the way, simply means teacher, really, somebody who taught the art of the knightly art of sword fighting to nobles. That in and of itself tells you something the fact that knights had teachers to show them techniques, not just instinctive bashing and flailing and all of that. If you look at Lichtenauer, for example, his, uh, his manuscript is in poem form. You've got verses. They were intended to be somewhat cryptic so that people who weren't supposed to learn these things couldn't. And then later manuscripts interpreted them and uh, spelled out basically what they meant. Anyway, back to Fiore. He covered just about everything, unarmored, dueling, which could be either judicial dueling or private dueling, uh, self-defense in the streets or at the tavern or who knows what, and also battlefield uh, application of these skills, for example, fighting on horseback. So he's got you know, the usage of a longsword in one hand, in two hands, armored fighting with a longsword, armored fighting with a poleaxe, etc etc so these are very different when you compare the techniques for fighting in a full suit of plate armor completely different you do not see cuts because what's the point you're not going to be able to slice through steel plate just like that so instead you have a lot of grappling you have in fact, he even has a sneaky uh, maneuver where he simply lifts up the opponent's visor and thrusts the blade into his face, which is uh, pretty bold and 
certainly would work. There are various ways of controlling the opponent, taking him down, which you find in other sources as well. That is important for a number of reasons. For one, if you get a knight or man-at-arms in full armor to the ground, he's a lot easier to deal with. You can then uh, draw your dagger and thrust it you know, through the eye slit or open up the visor, thrust them there, thrust into the neck or armpit or groin where they don't have solid plates, but just mail at best. Uh, and you can also that way force them to surrender because the best outcome is that you ransom a knight. You capture him and then you get paid a pretty sum to release him again to his family. And of course, grappling is also effective against armor because it's not necessarily going to protect you from having your shoulder dislocated or your elbow broken or, you know, your ACL torn. So basically they fought smarter, not harder. I'm sure they fought hard too, but the idea was to circumvent the armor. So you don't need to try to just hack through it. You would just bypass it whenever possible. Of course, it depends on the type of armor. You can't bypass a male hauberk as easily unless there are uncovered openings. Uh, you know, if they don't wear a gorget or something like that, then the neck might be exposed, the face might be exposed. A gambeson can be difficult to cut through, although from armor tests we found that it's really a matter of sharpness to a large extent. A sharper edge will have a much easier time going through padded armor, you know, any kind of fabric armor. Here's another point that seemed to go over that commodore's head, which is that you need proper cutting mechanics, and if you do have that, yes, you can increase the force. Uh, what I mean by that is, it, if you're trying to cut through a gambeson, for example, it doesn't really matter how strong you are and how hard you swing. If you swing like this, you know, with crappy edge alignment, it's not going to be able to bite. It's going to deflect the, the edge and you're not going to get very far outside of blunt impact trauma, which can still be effective, no doubt. If you hit somebody very hard with a sword, even if they're covered by a gambeson or, or even a male hauberk, you might be able to break bones underneath. But you still need, if you want to really cut through it, you need good edge alignment, meaning that it, the edge needs to follow the direction of your swing. You can't swing like this. This is what you want to do. And yes, you can put more force into it. So instead of going like this, you, know, you turn your body into it and you simply cut with more force, which is very easy to do. It doesn't change any of the techniques you're practicing. It just means that you put a little bit more power into it in real combat than you would in sparring, which I also don't understand where the, the confusion is there. Of course you don't strike your training partner as hard as you possibly can. Why would you? You're just increasing the risk of injury. You might give them a concussion or whatever. It's not necessary. As long as your cutting mechanics are good and your edge alignment is proper, then yes, in a real fight you would hit a little harder. Sure. That doesn't mean that a hit like this, for example, in sparring is light touch and wouldn't do anything because not enough force because you didn't hit as hard as you possibly could. No, it would still work. In fact, even with this level of force, it would work, particularly in unarmored combat, which this is supposed to simulate, this would be perfectly effective. And if you put more force into it, yeah, sure, it'll work. <laughs> That doesn't mean that this scene here in sparring is completely unrealistic, would never work, blah, blah, blah. I do agree that it's important to be aware of and avoid little tippy taps that are mechanically ineffective. You know, it's one thing how much force is in it, but another thing is just, you know, this, that's just not, it's not an effective cut. Even if you did this, you know, more forcefully, this is still not going to be a good cut, you know, compared to this. That's a, like you heard it prob probably. That's an effective cut. And if I do it with a little less force, that's still a pretty good cut. 
you know? And in some cases, an attack may not be supposed to be the finishing blow, but a setup. Uh, here's, for example, Fiore describing a cut to the forearm followed by a thrust to the torso. Uh, and by the way, thrusts, if you're wearing a gambeson, the thrust is the easiest way to go through it anyway. It does not take a lot of force to penetrate a gambeson with a thrust. There's also blunt impact being used for obvious reasons, even with a sword. You see strikes to the helmet with the pommel or the guard. Uh, of course, the good old murder stroke, which essentially turns the sword into an improvised hammer or mace, pole arm, however you want to look at it. Another related issue is that in one-on-one -on -one dueling in particular, there are situations where tactical value is more important than damage output, if you will. Uh, for example, in some situations, you may want to cut to what, what's called long point in the German tradition because you want to do something else from there or because you know that your opponent likes to defend and then counter whatever you're doing. Uh, one typical thing you can do against somebody who wildly overswings because they put too much force into it more than they can actually stop in time is you use footwork to get away from it and then immediately after you counter when they're just hanging out there for a moment until they recover for the next swing. So there are definitely situations where it's more important to keep yourself safe than to hurt the other guy. Again, this applies a lot more to unarmored dueling, which is what the majority of sources are about. You know, there are plenty of manuscripts that cover armored fighting as well, but unarmored is really very common. And for example, hits like this are controversial. You know, depending on who you ask, which humor practitioner, some will dismiss that as an invalid hit, others will accept it. I do agree that sturdy clothing could protect against something like this. However, if there is an opportunity for you to land a cut on the opponent's forearm, for example, without exposing yourself, you're still covered against any counter, you know, any kind of afterblow you catch, you're good. Even if it's only a shallow cut, or even if it doesn't do anything at all, you still succeeded in landing an attack without being attacked yourself. Now, this kind of thing is difficult to score in tournaments. You know, if you have to assign a point value to it, it's not easy. And you definitely should not score in such a way that encourages the tiniest little incidental contacts. You should definitely encourage committed cuts with follow through and proper edge alignment. As said, it definitely depends on the hit location as well. Something like this, I will definitely tell you, is not a valid cut generally. However, if you hit someone in the hand with this, I mean, tell me honestly, you would be willing to take this to your unprotected hand. No gauntlet, no glove. You wouldn't, unless you're insane. Cuts to unprotected hands are extremely dangerous, even more so if that hand is on the grip of a sword. Because now, this is essentially, this is like a chopping block for your fingers. If somebody cuts at your fingers when they are wrapped around your handle, your fingers get crushed between the blade and the handle of your sword. So yes, even this will definitely do damage. It may not get through sturdy clothing, uh, especially on the torso, but uh, even on the arms, if you're wearing a sturdy jacket, it probably wouldn't do anything. So generally, yes, you definitely need more, more rotation and follow through than that, but the hands are definitely very vulnerable, as is the face. You know, I mean, imagine taking this to the face. Again, you would not be very happy about that. This could you know, destroy an eye and it can cause a little bleeding that gets into your eyes, etc., etc. So this could be a follow-up or a preparation for a follow-up rather. You know, if you're able to land this to the head and then you follow through with a proper cut, 
then yeah, you may absolutely get away with that. And please do not misconstrue that as me trying to defend little tippy taps. Like I pointed out earlier in the video, that's generally to be discouraged. But um, in unarmored sword fighting, you don't need to swing like a rhinoceros with roid rage. And even against armor, it's generally better to do it smarter, attempting to bypass the armor than to use just brute force. I'm not saying that forceful attacks don't have their place. In fact, the manuscripts tell us to fence with the strength of the body, which is really a way to, of saying, don't just swing with your arms, but bring your body weight into it so you can strike harder, but more effectively, you know, you don't, expel extra energy while accomplishing less, but you're doing it in a more effective way to you know, generate as much force as possible and you know, transfer it effectively to the target. So there's nothing wrong with that, but to just claim that all of HEMA is useless because there's too little contact, light touch, etc. I mean, I can definitely tell you that I've done some sparring bouts with, with um, rather painful hits. Like you will definitely, even through the protective gear, you will absolutely feel it and sometimes injuries happen. Fortunately, not very often because yes, we do respect our training partners and don't try to bludgeon them to hell and back, but it can still happen. You know, it's, it's a weapon, it's designed as a force multiplier. So yeah, you can still give someone a concussion through a helmet if you're not careful, which means that, yeah, maybe you should be careful. Maybe you shouldn't just hit them with everything you've got. Do it with good form, do it efficiently, but maybe not as hard as you possibly could. If you ever find yourself in real life sore combat, post about it on Twitter, I guess. Although you might get banned. I don't know. If you ever find yourself in real sword combat, yeah, feel free to hit harder, but uh, otherwise... Sorry. <laughs> it's okay, I'm done anyway. And there we've got the perfect ending right there, creaky door. Um, yeah, hope you found this interesting. <laughs> Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.